Well, it's a real joy and a privilege to be with you tonight. I consider this um, uh, a privilege. I don't consider myself the expert. Actually, my wife is the expert since she trained nine children, four boys and five girls. But I will try to share what I can tonight. Hopefully, I can give you some tools to help you master potty training, to go from Huggies to Hanes, from wet to dry. What I'm going to cover tonight is some general information, and uh, we're going to look at addressing readiness. When is your child ready? We're going to look at several different aspects of that. And then we're going to look at do's and don'ts, some common mistakes, um, and some tricks that might help. And uh, we'll look at differences between boys and girls. And then we're at the end, uh, we'll have uh, plenty of time for questions. So if you think of any questions, just jot them down. The handout's in front of you. We tried to make them complete so you don't have to be writing notes or those kinds of things. Pretty much all the information will be there. And so um, just we want you just to relax and enjoy your time tonight. And hopefully this will be a helpful thing. Um, First of all, I want to ask, I know this is a very popular topic. Obviously, it's a concern that you uh, took a uh, time out of your busy schedules to be here tonight. If you Google toilet training on the uh, Internet, you're going to find one point, over 1.5 million entries. And um, so it's obviously a very popular uh, topic. Um, for, I want to ask, how many first-time toilet trainers are here tonight, parents who are trying to toilet train? All right. Great. And how many are second timers or have more than one child that they've toilet trained? Okay, so we've got some experts here. And grandparents. Yes, we've got a couple grandparents even. So we've got some real experts. So um, what? even in this room, we've got some cultural differences. And um, so we'll talk about that as well. So we're going to go from being wet to being dry. So that's our goal tonight, to bring you to that and give you the tools to do that. First of all, uh, uh, bowel and bladder control, there's a lot of cultural differences. Even if you look through the history, in the first half of the 20th century, there was an expectation that children should be toilet trained by 18 months of age. Uh, that has changed a little bit. Um, now we were averaging around 30 to 36 months of age. And part of that is based on the, the wonderful invention of disposable diapers, as well as an, a different approach in 1962. Dr. Brazelton was a pediatrician who took, uh, felt that some of the approaches that were taken earlier were harsh and maybe a little bit uh, caused maybe some problems later on in, in childhood and adulthood. So uh, he took a child center approach. And so that um, is kind of where we're coming from today. Um, expectations in the United States are daytime dryness is usually by four years of age, nighttime dryness by six years of age. The average age is 30 months, which with a large, uh, uh, you know, uh, in differences between boys and girls and in different cultures. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics says that 40% of all three-year-olds are, are toilet trained, um, but we have a range all the way from 18 months up to three or four years. And typically, bladder uh, uh, or bowel control con uh, proceeds, um, uh, uh, or daytime bladder control proceeds bowel control, and dry nights uh, gen generally follow well after both. Girls are ahead of boys. Why that is, nobody knows for sure. Some people uh, speculate that it's because um, boys have their moms as models, and so that may maybe makes them later. I have a different opinion. After watching four boys and five girls, I think boys just don't care if they're dirty. So bedwetting is normal up to age four in girls, age five in boys. Early training, less than two years of age, is discouraged because of the associated other problems, psych problems, chronic bowel uh, retention, and a problem we call incapricis. That's when kids are, have chronic constipation and they start to stool and leak as they get older because they've been holding their stool because they associate it with pain or a negative experience. The key factor in, in success, though, is the readiness of the child. And that's what we're going to talk a lot about tonight. Um, 90 to 95% of kids are, by age five, are totally uh, daytime trained. 80 to 85% are totally nighttime trained. So you can see there's a, a group of kids that go on to be even a little older and, and still are, haven't obtained that. Um, what we look for, in, uh, we ask questions like, does your child communicate to you before the passage of urine or stool? Are they somehow tell you that they need to go? 
or that uh, they feel like it's coming, can he or she hold it for a minute or two before urinating or defecating? If they can go for a couple hours dry or even go four hours uh, through the night dry, that's probably a sign that they're starting to um, obtain that control, that physical ability to control. So many children uh, master toilet training with ease, particularly once they're able to ver verbalize their body ne bodily needs. For others, toilet training can involve a protracted power struggle. And as you know, you, you in here who have more than one child, every child is different. I mean, there can be day and night differences even. Um, and you wonder if they're even in the same, you know, belong in the same family. Refusal to defecate in the toilet or potty is, re is relatively common. And it can lead to the stool holding that we talked about and, and also parent, uh, parents being frustrated. The, to the process of toilet training involves positive reinforcement by the parents who recognize that their child is ready. And we'll talk about that. We recognize they're at a correct developmental stage to begin that process. There's minor hurdles in toilet training, um, such as the fear of the toilet accidents, um, uh, and motiva motivating the child, uh, uh, not to wear diapers, and if they, it, it, all this should be taken with a calm, easy approach. And, and just keep in mind that, you know, it's going to happen. As, as I uh, as said it early in the talk, all nine of my children are toilet trained at ages 30 to th through 13. So it's going to happen eventually. So, you know, take a good approach. Life is short. Uh, enjoy the, the ride, so to speak, as you go along. And um, realize there's going to be accidents, there's going to be problems, there's going to be struggles along the way, but um, your attitude makes a big difference. So let's go down this path. Let's look at how we can um, get to the, uh, uh, the, the process of toilet training. So we, we look at these essential things to know if a child is going to have bladder control. Now, one thing um, I want to point out, and this is something that maybe in the last year I've become more aware of, um, you know, there are kids that you'll hear stories of kids that are toilet trained, potty trained by eight or nine months. So we have a friend from China who tells us that that's a common thing in their country, that there are kids that, you know, in a country where they don't have disposable diapers, that the, the kids usually are trained by eight or nine months. Now, when I ask more questions about that, what I realize it isn't the child wasn't really physically ready to be trained, trained, but what happened is the parents recognized that, that when the child was gonna have a bowel movement and the parents are home all day long with the child, they recognize cues here and there. Um, uh, we even had a child in the clinic who I, I had spent a little time talking to the mom. She could tell when it was time to urinate and she'd run the child over to a, a toilet seat, a, a potty chair, uh, or defecate. And so that basically who is really trained is the question, was it the child or the parent? So what we're talking about is the child who makes the decision to go to the bathroom on the toilet and is able to do that and complete it successfully. So that's what we're talking about, essential elements of bladder control. So the child needs to be aware that their bladder is, is filling that they're, and that um, their brain, the brain overrides the, the reflex of uh, bladder contractions. In other words, there, there can be spasms that the bladder will have and they'll lose, lose their urine. Um, they, they have the ability to consciously tighten the sphincter to prevent incontinence. In other words, not, they can control that to some extent. Uh, they can control it consciously, they can control it unconsciously. Um, normal bladder growth, um, it, that's also important to understand the volume of the bladder. And you can take a simple formula, take the, the number of years plus two, and that will give you the volume of a normal, of that size of bladder. So if, in other words, if you have a three-year-old plus two, that means that that bladder can hold five ounces. So that's important to know because if they drink eight ounces before they go to bed at night, then there's going to be something that happens before morning because it can't hold all eight ounces. So, and that's, that's important to know as you're, as you're doing this process. And then motivation is huge. And as you know, every child is different. Uh, certain things motivate some kids and not others. And motivation is very important for the child to stay, stay dry. We also look at um, physical readiness and we look at certain developmental milestones to see if the physical ability is there, you know, for them to walk over to the toilet and, and pull down their pants. There has to be the ability to walk and run steadily. 
They have to be able to urinate a fair amount at one time, not just little spots. So uh, again, having control over the, the um, muscles that open and close the, the opening of the bladder. They have regular, well-formed bowel movements at relatively predictable times. So um, when you start to see that, that's also a sign that they're getting ready to, to uh, uh, begin the toilet training process. They have dry periods of at least three to four hours, which shows that the bladder muscles are developing enough to hold urine. So those, those are important cues that you look for. Not only physical cues do we look for, but we also look for behavioral signs. We look for things like, can they sit down in one place long enough to have a bowel movement or urinate? Can they pull their pants up and down? I mean, those are little processes that we take for granted, but that's, those are important developmental abilities and physical milestones that they have to reach to be able to do. Do they dislike the feeling of wearing a wet or dirty diaper? Again, an important thing, as I think is the difference between boys and girls. Do they show interest in others' bathroom habits? You know, as they, um, curiosity is a common thing that kids display. And as they watch a big brother or big sister or, or, or dad or mom, then they want to uh, oftentimes imitate and do what they're doing. Do they give a physical or verbal sign when they're having a bowel movement, such as grunting, squatting, or, or telling you they're about ready to do that? Um, do they demonstrate a desire for independence, which about the time of two years of age, that's also the time when we see kids start to exert their, their independence. And that's also part of the problem of toilet training because uh, as you've heard the term terrible twos, that's, a, that's there for a reason because that's when the power, they realize at age two, just because they were told to do it doesn't mean they have to do it. They have the ability to do something else. And so that's where the power struggles can come in and, and begin. Um, and then also, do they take pride in their accomplishments? That's important because, you know, if they get excited and, um, you know, rewards play a huge role. And also just the ability to accomplish something, that they start to show that. And, um, and that also is very helpful. Other things, are they resistant to uh, learning to use the toilet? In other words, you know, there, you think of this um, a huge monstrosity. We called it the porcelain pond at our house. Um, our oldest son was actually attracted to it and liked to play in it all the time at 18 months. But you know, for some kids, um, they can be afraid of that. It's loud, it's big, and um, uh, you know, it's, uh, things disappear when you turn that little handle. Um, is it generally a cooperative stage, not a negative or a contrary one, which you might ask yourself uh, uh, how many two-year-olds are at uh, you know, cooperative stages? And can they follow simple instructions such, such as go get the toy or do this or bring this here to me? Those are important developmental things that are necessary to begin that process. They understand about the value of putting things where they belong. You know, the, uh, as the, that's why we're doing the toilet training. You know, before they um, had their bowel movements in their pants or urinated in their pants, now we're going to teach them there's a better place and um, an easier place to put it. And do they, have they had a vocabulary for some of these words and these terms? So you're beginning to uh, describe stool and urine, whatever word is culturally acceptable at your house, the poo poo, caca, pee pee, those kinds of words, that they understand what it is that you're talking about. Um, and um, do they also um, understand the physical signals? It's going to happen. So they can feel that you know they're ready to have a bowel movement. They can feel that they're they're getting ready to um, urinate. Those are all very important developmental milestones for them to be able to have. So we're going to look now at some common mistakes that prevent us from becoming dry and, and reaching our goal. And we're going to look at each of these in detail. Um, and um, common mistakes are beginning the training at a, at the wrong time. <laughs> So um, uh, not making the right preparation, not establishing the right environment for the potty training success, or trying to force or coerce the child to learn to use the potty. And again, we can do that unconsciously sometimes as well, just through, through our attitudes. First of all, let's start with training at the wrong time. We, first of all, we can start too early. Um, we can, um, when the child is not physically or emotionally ready. And that can, you know, like we talked about in the first half of the 20th century, most kids were 12 to 18 months was the time when people would start toilet training. Now we're talking about waiting until 18 months. Now, I, when I say that, there are kids that might be ready sooner than that. They're, they're definitely physically, emotionally, 
especially if they have older siblings, um, uh, that could happen. Um, so we certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to restrict that. But, you know, if in general, before 18 months, physically and emotionally, they might not be ready to begin this process. You could do it at the wrong times. When would wrong times occur? Well, uh, for example, um, my granddaughter, who was at 21 months, she spent a week with grandpa and grandma while her new little brother was born. And so um, she, in, in that week, um, she was through, probably 75% toilet trained. She was excited. Everything was going great. And she gets home and sees her little brother and took three steps backwards. So I can tell you today, at almost three years of age, she still wears a diaper and is happy to do that. And, as, and hopefully when she comes at the end of this month, my 13, almost 14-year-old daughter, is her major, major goal is to have her toilet trained by the time she goes back home again. Um, so in a new baby, that, that's a stressful time, you know. And I think a big thing that we see with toilet training is as they're leaving diapers, um, you know, that is a time of attention. I mean, it takes time. It's, it's, you could argue how good a quality time it is changing a child's diaper, but it's time that they're spending with mom and dad. And, and one thing I've learned over being a parent and being a doctor is that uh, uh, any kind of attention is better than no attention at all. So I think that is one thing that happens is the, the attention that, that they don't want to leave um, or just before a vacation. You know, you're in a hurry. You're trying to get things together. You think, well, boy, it sure be great if we didn't have to change diapers in the car on the way. And, um, you know, that, that's uh, the kids will feel rushed. They'll feel pressure. Or when you're starting daycare, some daycares require that the kids be toilet trained. And so there's that, that push unconsciously sometimes to get them trained before the first day of daycare. And, um, and kids will feel that. During times of high stress for kids or marriage or divorce, moving to a new house, that's a huge stressor. Um, summer versus winter. You know, in the summertime in general, although I think things have changed a lot, um, uh, even in the last, from when I was toilet trained, um, I think life is in general busier. I don't know, most people agree with that, um, with both parents sometimes working and, um, you know, all the things that are going on, all the activities. In general, summer tends to be a little bit slower time, tends to be a little bit easier to, you know, kids are out of school, a little easier time to devote to um, toilet training. Um, Wait until the normal flow and activity resumes and, you, and uh, routines establish uh, a security for your child. You might be asking yourself tonight, when does that ever happen in our house? You know, when does normal flow and activity ever resume? It seems like we're always going. But, you know, in general, um, kids find security from routines. They find security from, you know, everything being the same. And that also is another uh, drawback. Kids in general are resistant to change. They, you know, going from... Uh, wearing diapers, which is a form of security, to now doing something totally new and wonderful might not be as, as, as fun and exciting to them as it might seem to us. And, um, and so any kind of change might challenge that security. So, um, but establishing a routine establishes more security for kids. It also helps place uh, her toilet easily alongside other structures or routines. In other words, it just becomes a daily process. A part of the normal routine is kind of like brushing your teeth or washing your hands before you eat. It's all just part of the normal process. And then establishing the right preparation. And that, that includes, and again, it's, it doesn't cost a lot of money. It's, it, you know, it's very inexpensive. Uh, you, you get the right clothing. So you think about it, you know, developmental stage of using fingers for fine motor activities like buttoning and zipping, um, dresses, skirts, pants with elastic waistbands uh, like sweatpants, pajama bottoms, shorts. Those are much easier to pull up and down than, say, snap jeans with a zipper or, or those kinds of things. Um, don't use clothes that are difficult for either you or your child to manage. Overall, suspenders, snaps, buttons, zippers. Uh, other fasteners and the famous onesie. That's a real struggle for some kids. Um, and then prepare by example. You know, same gender parent can definitely give the example. Um, and kids learn. They've been designed to learn by following example. And so by watching dad or a um, uh, 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 little girl watching mom, that, that's a huge thing. Or big brother. Um, and, and they learn uh, that, boy, this is a possibility here. Uh, prepare by teaching. 
dumping the stool in the toilet and flushing, uh, the proper place for all things, all things in their proper place, and that's what we want kids to learn. Uh, practice dry runs, for example, fully clothed sitting on the toilet or sitting on the toilet seat. And that we recommend probably starting with a toilet seat just because the little toilet chair, inexpensive, it doesn't have to have a bunch of bells and whistles, you know, musical, all those things are nice. You can pick them up inexpensively or even at garage sales. And um, uh, so, uh, you know, it's an easy thing to do. So here we have an example of modeling behaviors. Uh, uh, here we have a mom in the bathroom saying, what have I told you? Never bother mommy when she's in the bathroom. So we don't want to model that necessarily. Establishing the right environment. So, you know, we get the right uh, equipment and then the right environment. So a potty chair, that's the normal proper height, the size, design. It, it can be, you can just keep it simple. You know, I think it's best to keep things simple. Although sometimes it's nice to have a Mickey Mouse uh, you know, potty chair or, or some of the bells and whistles, but you don't have to. You can just keep it simple. Kids don't care. Toilet uh, with accessible uh, step and stable lid. It's important, um, you know, because, uh, you know, to get up to the toilet easily. So sometimes they need a step. Um, and then as they, as they graduate to the big toilet, you have to be careful of that, that lid because it can come down hard on those little appendages, cause a lot of damage and fear. And so you don't want, you want that to happen. Uh, pull-ups, training pants, underwear, and that's where it starts to get fun and exciting, where they can go out and pick out their training pants, their underwear, you know, Spider-Man, uh, uh, you know, uh, what Dora, whatever the, the famous or favorite is, um, and then they feel a part of the process as well. Uh, don't discount the child's fear. Slippery toilet seats, loud flushing toilets, little bottoms touching water, wet slippery bathroom floors, the snake in the toilet. Uh, can set them back to square one or require a hiatus or a little vacation from toilet training. And di don't discount attachments, and, uh, so, uh, which is kind of an unusual, rare thing, but that can happen. And then not to coerce the child or the toilet training. Don't set deadlines either for the child or for yourself, you know. And unfortunately, I see a lot of times not just daycare, but, you know, even well-meaning, you know, mother-in-laws or father-in-laws or grandparents, um, uh, might might put pressure again. They came from a different culture sometimes, and so um, don't give in to those external pressures. The grandparents, friends, daycare, preschool administrators, don't get caught up in competition. You might as well start with toilet training. When you hear your neighbor say, "Well, Joey toilet trained when he was 12 months old," I mean, it doesn't stop with toilet training. It's it's going to be later on how far he hit the baseball, and then later on what college he goes to, and then what job he has. So you might as well start not getting caught up in the competition early on. So remember, it's your it's you and your child, and and that's going to be different from anyone else. You don't need to bribe, uh, but work with the child's natural motivations. So bribing is you have to think of a two or three year old. There they think concretely. You know, two weeks is a forever. Um, and even two days ago was, a, was, you know, another lifetime ago. So it's a here and now. And so basically a reward is after they've accomplished something, then they receive a reward. And I, I love stickers. And if you ever come into our clinic, we couldn't, we couldn't run our clinic without stickers and, and toys. And so we, you can use a sticker, a, you can use um, like a small sticker just for the fact that they tried. You can use a larger sticker if they were successful with, you know, urinating, and a big sticker if they were had, you know, were able to pass a bowel movement. So, um, so you, so that helps to motivate the child. That's different than a bribe that says, you know, if you if you can go to the bathroom, we're going to go to Disneyland in in six months. You know, that doesn't usually work. So, um, don't worry, be happy, use patience, and the golden rule: take, you know. Treat others as you'd like them, to, as you would have liked to have been treated, or as you'd like others to treat you. Take the necessary time. I think that's one of the biggest things. If more than anything, I can't stress that enough. You know, kids respond to attention from their parents, and and, and this is a, a wonderful time of of attention and you know feedback where they're accomplishing something, they're hearing praise or they're hearing encouragement um, uh, from their parents spending time with them. And, and so when you have the time to do that, that's when you wanna to try to do it. Um, encourage them, and that's the biggest thing, praising them, and, and the most important thing, have fun, both of you together while you're doing it. Life's too short to do otherwise. So now we wanna talk a little bit about um, 
uh, some other readiness things about uh, how do you start this process early? Well, at about 18 months, you could start to teach about the pee and the poop and other body works and how the body functions. You can start to, um, you know, clarify that everybody, you know, makes pee and poop. That's normal. That's a normal process. You can point out when dogs and other animals are going pee and poop. That's just as your walk, 18 month old understands that. Um, clarify the body signals when you observe them. Your body wants to make some pee pee or poop. Uh, you know, just think about talking with an 18 month old. Um, um, praise your child for passing poop in the diaper. I mean, that's that's a, uh, they obviously uh, uh, had to work at it. Don't don't refer to poop as dirty or yucky. Now, I came across a website that I thought was kind of funny, and it said that toilet, you know, there were so many different websites that you go to, 1.5 million, you can imagine. But one of the websites was Toilet Training Stinks. I thought that was kind of funny. But, you know, that's what you don't want to communicate. It's just it's a normal part of the normal processes. You know, sure, it doesn't smell very nice, but that's the way everybody's poop smells. And so, you know, that's, that's all part of life. And rather than make it a dirty or a yucky thing, it's just a, a normal process. Um, and again, that when it hits the floor or it makes a mess too, that's, you have to maintain that attitude as much as you can as well. Don't refer or make, make changing diapers pleasant so your child will come to you when it's time to have his diaper changed. Change your, diaper, or change your child frequently so he'll prefer to have dry diapers rather than dirty or wet diapers. You know, it's, he'll have the contrast to compare to. Teach your child to come to, to you whenever he's wet or soiled. So that's, what, that's beginning at 18 months, so beginning that process. Um, they can take that diaper then and take it over the toilet and flush it down the toilet. And learning that's where it goes. At 21 months, you, you can begin to teach them about the potty and the toilet. Teach what the toilet and the potty chair are for. The pee and poop goes in this special place. Demonstrate by dumping it for them and having them do it. Portray using this, the toilet and potty chair as a privilege. You know, it's, it's something that they can do and they, and they should take pride in doing it. Have him or her observe toilet training, use the toilet or potty chair, have an older uh, toilet trained sibling, that can be very helpful, especially if you ever read anything about uh, birth order, you know, third borns, fourth borns um, tend to really emulate older brothers and sisters. So siblings can, can in positive sense and sometimes a negative sense can teach a lot of things. So, um, and by a floor level potty chair, that's important. You know, when you've got to go up a set of stairs or go down a set of stairs to get to a toilet, that's really difficult for a two or three-year-old. It's a major accomplishment. So try to have that, you know, in an accessible place right off the, in like a quarter in the kitchen or off the kitchen or dining room, wherever you're spending the majority of time. That, that, that is a very helpful thing. Make it clear that this is the child's special chair. This is theirs. This, is, this belongs to them. This is their... This is nobody else's. You can put their, have them put their name on it even so that they can own it. Have your child sit on the potty for fun. You're fully clothed like we talked about to do dry runs. Those are all helpful things to kind of have them just realize this is part of the normal process. So that's, you, those are things you can do even long before they're ready to, to go through the full process. That's the preparation ahead of time. Differences between boys and girls. Well, first of all, boys take longer. We've talked about that. Boys will stand, where and sometimes um, uh, uh, you know that can get messy, um, especially as they're watching dad. So you know it's better to make it a two-step process: sitting first and standing later. And it was interesting. Uh, one little girl in the clinic was watching all the boys at daycare, and so she was. The mom had come and said, well, "You know, she's standing." Um, and to go to the bathroom and she doesn't want to sit down. She wants to stand like everybody else does. So, you know, again, they learn from, from uh, uh, example. And then girls wipe. Um, uh, that, that's an important process to teach them and help them with that. They wipe from the front to the back, which isn't easy to do. So they'll need help in the beginning. Because of that, we'll see that, you know, uh, there'll be more of an instance of bladder infections for little girls. Just the, and then that way the anatomy set up you know, it's easy for fecal organisms to get up there in the bladder. And so little girls can have one bladder infection. That can also cause accidents. That's another cause for failure for, for toilet training. So you have to keep that in mind. Little boys should really never have a bladder infection. I mean, if there is, there's usually uh, a, some kind of reason that, that needs to be investigated. So, uh, but girls can have up to two bladder infections. And remember, don't treat accidents like a big deal. They're going to happen. It's going to happen. You just you might as well expect it. And, and, and when you do, your attitude will play a huge role. Again, you always want to be positive as much as possible in this process. 
and you want to um, have them feel like this is a fun thing, an accident's going to happen. It's just, you know, you can involve them in cleaning it up to whatever extent they're able to, but it's just a part of life. It's a part of the potty training process. Over overemphasizing accidents can actually uh, lead to more accidents. It can, you know, um, cause some real negative things. Generally, the problem is not with the child, but it's it's with, or the trainer, but with the understanding the problem, the preparation, and the method. Diffusing issues um, uh, by temporary cessation of, of training is important sometimes. Just like my granddaughter, they uh, you know when she got home, you know toilet training was the last thing they were concerned about. So they took a, they've taken a little vacation. Sometimes you have to do that, especially if you're seeing that it's not going well. So rather than forcing it or or pushing it. To say, hey, you know, we'll just put this this toilet seat away, and um, we'll try this again maybe in a couple weeks. Especially if it's during those times that we talked about with the high stress, a new house, a new baby, uh, uh, you know, divorce, um, different things like that. Um, and then later on, uh, they they can master toiletry. They can master going to the bathroom and realize it's going to happen. They're going to do it. It's going to happen someday. And, um, and just as a matter of uh, being patient and, and waiting for that. So here we have a picture of a child who's successfully toilet training. You can see she's comfortable. She, maybe she learned some, some modeling here, I don't know, uh, reading a newspaper on the toilet. Um, and, um, but um, she's pulled her pants down, she's sitting there comfortably, and she's successful. So, a couple things um, that kind of keep it easy. Um, ABCs of a potty training. Uh, first of all, assess your, assess your child's readiness. Are they ready? Are you ready? Do you have the time? That's important. Are you, are you going to be able to devote the time to do this? Are you feel like you're in the mind frame where you're not stressed and you can be patient and, and, and deal with accidents and all the things that might come with this? Um, create a routine. Again, you know, a routine that we like to do and we recommend is that if um, we all have a, the, this tendency to have a bowel movement 20 minutes after a meal. And so most kids defecate or go to the bathroom, you know, three to four times a day. So you can try to time that with, you know, sitting on the toilet 20 minutes after a meal. Um, and that takes advantage of that natural tendency for them to have a bowel movement. And let's say you have a three-year-old. So then you would have them sit on the, to on the toilet seat, on the to uh, potty chair, um, for a one minute for every year of age, uh, 20 minutes after their meal, and just make that part of the routine. It's just, just like they wash their hands before the meal, and after the meal, they're going to go to the bathroom 20 minutes afterwards. And then when they are successful, make a big deal out of it. Praise is a huge thing. It helps them to take uh, you know, pride in what they've done, and, and it, it also increases their motivation to want to do it again. And it's, it becomes a real positive thing, a real uh, uh, you know, a positive attention getter, and, um, and so it's very helpful. Um, you can buy a little egg timer inexpensively um, to sit on the back of the toilet. It can have a little Mickey Mouse on it, or they can write their name on it to own it. And then you set it for three minutes. And when that goes off, um, if they, even if they weren't successful, it's time to get off the toilet. So then they're not sitting there for half an hour or 45 minutes and then, you know, having a very negative experience. Um, uh, demonstrate for your child like we talked about. Explain the process. You know, 18-month-olds um, um, are understand a certain level, just like you heard me t say earlier. And a 21-month-old, 24-month-old uh, understands quite a bit. And so you can explain this to them, explain what they're doing. Sometimes you get some very interesting questions, and you, know, you, you realize they understand a lot more than I thought they did. And so, um, so be sure to uh, talk to them, explain it to them. Um, foster the habit, F for foster the habit. Um, again, the routine. Is, you know, take that advantage of uh, the three meals a day and right before bedtime. Make that part of the nighttime routine. We're going to sit on the toilet for three minutes, and and then if you have a if you go poo poo, then great. And then we'll have a sticker or we'll have whatever it is. Um, and um, handle set uh, grab some training packs. In other words, take them out and let them be part of that. Let them go out pick out you know the Spider Man or the the uh, Dora training pants or or big boy pants or big girl pants. Um, Handle setbacks gracefully. 
Um, that's really important. If they if they see, you know, and it's, you know, all of it. I, I, you know, I, I understand. I love talking to parents because I is one. And I know what it's like to be frustrated. I know what it's like to be stressed. And, and you know, I, I wish I could stand up and say I've never lost my temper with my kids. But, um, you know, it happens. But if you, if you have that happen on a regular basis, then, um, you know, it's a real negative experience. Introduce night training. And again, that's, you know, the you know, limit the fluids after supper. So if it's a three-year-old, you don't, you have, you can let them drink. Most kids like to drink before bedtime. That can be part of their nighttime routine. Have them go to the bathroom before bedtime so they can empty their bowel or their bladder, have that opportunity at least. And then be sure be, from, you know, supper time at six o'clock, they haven't had more than, than the five ounces for the three-year-old because that's the volume of the bladder. So, you know, that, that way you're setting them up to be successful. If they have, you know, 16 ounces from six to nine o'clock and go to bed at nine, then they're, they're going to be swimming by morning. So, um, so keep that in mind. Um, and then J for jump for joy. And here we have, um, uh, no, they didn't win the lottery. Their three-year-old just got potty trained. So, so some potty training tricks. Um, you know, there's all kinds of helps out there. Uh, the potty training videos, books, online. There's them, some things that are helpful, some things that might not be so helpful. Um, uh, so there's all kinds of helpful aids out there. I, I, I was looking online today, and I saw a, one woman um, creatively developed a calendar that um, uh, you, you, uh, she, she took like that little technology where you have the greeting cards where you can speak into it and it'll say something and it, and it praises the child when, if they were successful and it'll say, good big boy, you know, you get open door one. And so they open door one and there's a little prize behind there. So that motivates them. So things that those are just one of the many tools that are out there, not that I'm promoting anything, but those are, it gives you an idea. Every child is different. Um, at the clinic, we'll, we will do things like that, you know, where we'll have them pick out a Hot Wheel car, you know, or they'll have, you know, this is what you, you get since you were successful. And those, those kinds of things are really go a long way with kids. Um, and so, um, and you can pick up those things inexpensively, um, you know, uh, at any dime store. Um, and then uh, this really, and then potty training, incentive charts and calendars where you get a chart and, or a calendar this time of year, you can buy them very inexpensively, and you put st have the child put a sticker on that for, uh, for every day that they were dry, so they can watch their progress. So even though you're seeing them every day, you don't always see that progress from day to day, and so you're thinking, boy, they, you know, I don't think we're making any progress. But as you look at the calendar, as they look at the calendar, they say, well, it used to be every day, now it's only twice a week. I'm only having you being wet during the day twice a week. So that's a really helpful thing for them, as well as it motivates them. Um, and for little boys, this is really helpful. It seems like boys always love a challenge. So uh, little potty targets in the toilet are helpful. So they can aim and, and shoot and those kinds of things. Stepping stools, potty chairs, potty seat inserts as they get bigger and ready to advance from the toilet, uh, potty chair up to the big toilet. They can get that potty seat insert. Uh, Pre-moistened wipes make it easier for them. Hand, I'll be sure to teach hand washing technique as part of this. Modesty as part of this. Close the bathroom door. You know, then there's the public restroom issue, you know, where you want to be with them, go, always go with them into the public restroom. And, um, uh, and then traveling ideas. You can, there's all kinds of traveling things there. As you travel, you want to keep in mind, you know, I've got a three-year-old here who's in the process of toilet training, so I, I might not be able to go 200 miles without stopping. I might have to stop more frequently. There's the potty travel seats, uh, the travel chairs. Those kinds of things are helpful, and, and, uh, and you can put that in with all the other things you have to pack when you travel when you have a two-year-old or a three-year-old. What works? Waiting until your child is ready, and you've heard me say that over and over again. Now, at the same time, um, you know, there's a window in time, I think. Like with my granddaughter, um, I, I use her as an example just because I see this frequently. When kids are ready, and you know, they're not, they're not necessarily going to, you're going to, one morning, they're going to stand by your bedside and say, hey, dad, hey, mom, um, at 19 months of age, I want a toilet train today. You know, and that isn't what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, look for those cues. 
that you know they they are showing you that they're physically they're emotionally ready and then encourage them and and um uh, you know give them the opportunity to do the exactly what you want them to do and teaching them showing them communicating well what are the expectations here what is it exactly we want you to do and then if accidents don't react to that so make a plan take it slow uh, praise your child that that that's a huge thing motivate your child every child is different you know, um, one, you know, we don't always encourage, we tend not to encourage food as a reward, but one mom shared with me one time that, um, you know, she gave, when her child was successful, um, uh, he, she gave him a, an M&M. And he was so excited that, you know, for the next several days, she couldn't find him. And every time she went to look for him, he was sitting on the toilet waiting to get another M&M. So sometimes it can be very effective. Um, accepting there will be accidents, understand that, be patient and and for the uh, overall, have fun. What doesn't work? Starting too soon. Starting at the wrong time. Putting on the pressure. Following your mother-in-law's timetable rather than yours. Being in a hurry. Getting frustrated with the child. And then punishing the child. Well, those are all things that, that are going to make a real negative experience. And they're, they're going to really... Um, you know, cause problems. So you want to want to be really careful about it. You never want to punish a child as they're going through this process or belittle the child or call them a bad child. You know, they can be a big boy or a big girl, but bad boy or bad girl, you don't want to stay away from that because then, you know, you're belittling them. It's it, You want to try to stay as positive as possible and not be negative because uh, that's where some of the, the bad side effects come in. And as far as I know, they haven't developed a breed of dog yet, but I'm still waiting for that to help with toilet training. So, um, so what we'll do now is um, we'll stop here and just take your questions. Any questions tonight? Yes. What's the difference between a bribe and a reward? Well, a bribe would be more like, and, and you know, it's a fine line. Um, uh, like I said, the kids are... Um, well, here, I've got some examples here. The bribe precedes the behavior. The reward follows the behavior. Now, and at the same time, though, I said, you know, you can set, and the older kids especially, you can set up goals. You can say, you know, um, if you can go all day today with, with dry, we're going to put a sticker on the calendar so they understand that. Um, and, and so the kids are short term, you know, they're concrete thinkers. So you have to do little by little. So that's, that's what I mean by reward. Whereas a bribe would be, you know, um, boy, you're never going to be able to drive a car when you're 16 if you don't get toilet trained, you know. So that's that's what I'm talking about, those kinds of things. So um, don't scold or nag. That's another thing you want to be really careful. Um, and don't turn it into a moral issue like we talked about, good or bad. Um, yeah, but instead, um, you know, you did a good job or you're um, rather than you're a good boy. You know, you don't want to make it into a moral issue. So, yes. I have um, three little ones that I have a... I'm adopted, I've adopted one, and the other two are going to be in next week. And they're all close in age. There's a three-year-old and then a two-year-old that's going to be three, and then the two-year-old. Mm -hmm. The three-year-old um, is a girl, and she's, they've all got developmental problems. And I think the three-year-old's ready, because sometimes she goes to the bathroom, sometimes she doesn't. And, um, but the two-year-old little boy, that's going to be three in July. He just doesn't care. He don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And everybody keeps telling me he's ready. He's ready, and he don't act like he's ready. What do I tell those people that are sitting there saying, "Yeah, he's ready. Go ahead and start potty training." It's like I know he's not ready. Yeah. Well, and I think you just answered your question. I mean, you know, you as a parent know when your child is ready. I mean, nobody else knows better than you do, and. So um, again, you, you said there might be some developmental issues too. So kids that are develop, have developmental issues, as we've talked about, you know, whether it's a physical developmental issue or, or emotional or even you know, mental, they're, they're gonna be delayed. On the average, they're gonna be 30% you know, longer than, um, than kids that are, you know, don't have those issues to deal with. So um, you as a, again, don't cave into those pressures, outside pressures. That's probably one of the biggest things 
that we see that that unconsciously even can motivate us as parents. You know, um, you know, where you know your your own parents might say, "Well, boy, you never had problems when you were a kid, and we we trained you just fine." Or if they go over to grandparents, like my uh, my granddaughter did, and they come home, and we, and we we had to be real careful to say, "Well, look, we we had her almost trained at our house." You know, so you, we have to be real careful of those things as grandparents as well. But, um, but you know, as a parent, when she's ready, so nobody else can tell you that. And and again, you've got some tools here that help you to know um, if physically, emotionally, and um, uh, socially, they're ready to do that. So, yes. Um, my daughter, she's 19 months, so I know she's still young, but she hates her diaper. She mm -hmm. loves wearing little underwear. She loves flushing the toilet. She'll run to the bathroom just to do that. She'll go with me to the bathroom every time and sit on the, her little potty and she does the whole thing. But if I have her sit on the bathroom or go to the bathroom, she'll sit there and she'll play and it's fun and it's games. And it's, so I, I take it slow, I don't mind. And um, as soon as I take her off the toilet, she'll run off and she gets real proud of herself and she'll like be on the carpet. So how do I get her to start doing it while she's sitting on the toilet instead of running off and going and peeing on my carpet somewhere? Yeah, that sounds like a challenge. Um, you know, things you can do is take advantage of the gastrocolic reflex like we talked about, you know. So try to get her on a routine. And, and kids' bowel habits will become routine many times, just like ours can. Um, and so if you take it, take advantage of that, rather than have her kind of be in the driver's seat, put her in a routine where, you know, it's, it's going to be more of a habitual thing for her. So 20 minutes after a meal, uh, have her go sit on the toilet, you know, and um, or you can sit in there with her and and then set the timer. And if she's successful, you know, because a lot of times they don't have much control over that. And so if she's successful. You know, has she ever been successful in the toilet? Oh, a good four, five, six hours and not have accidents and show Lydia's parents. Lydia? Lydia's parents. And she'll use the potty, like she'll she'll do it well. She doesn't like being wet. She doesn't like diapers by any means. She screams and kicks and cries when you put diapers on her. But she just thinks it's hilarious. She'll and now she learned the word funny, so she'll go do it and come back and go, Mommy, I find me, I find me. I'm like, No, <laughs> you're not funny. Yeah. So <laughs> Well and then, you know, that's a that's a situation where um, you know, things you can do now that sounds like she's definitely physically able to um, if she's been successful, you know, she kind of understands the process. She's motivated. She's just kind of going down the wrong road a little bit. So things that you can do to help with that, you wouldn't want to punish her for that. But what you can help her do is take responsibility for what she did. So even at 19 months, she can come and help you clean that up. And it's usually a negative reinforcer in that sense. You know, um, you know, to some extent, you know, putting a, a, a rag there and sponging up the urine. To, you know, obviously she's not going to be able to do all of it. But just to see what, what's involved when she doesn't do the right thing in the right place. And so, you know, all things in their proper place. The carpet isn't the best place for this. The toilet is. And that's why we have this special little seat for you. And then in the morning, you know, kind of um, preempt things a little bit. You know, today we're going to go in the potty. You know, today we're going to be a big girl and go in the potty. And we're going to and then get her in the routine. And, and you'll, you'll, it sounds like you're almost there. You just got a little bump in the road to get over here. So, yeah. But as she, as she gets success... And as she gets rewarded for that, and then and she realizes, boy, there's consequences. You know, it isn't so funny when I have to go out and it's not very nice. It doesn't smell good. All those things. Um, then, uh, what you, so you, in a sense, you're teaching her also the responsibility, and, and so that's a helpful thing. So, yes. You talked about 20 minutes after meals. What about fluids? Is there an average time frame that? kidneys kind of make the urine for kids? Well, morning, definitely when they wake up in the morning, that's a great time to have them sit on the toilet to empty their bladders. Because um, a lot of times they wake up dry. And if they wake up dry, that's perfect. It's time to go sit on the toilet. And you can sometimes run the water or run the shower. That, that's a helpful thing. Um, uh, you know, those are kind of things you can do to, and then when they're successful, reward them. Um, and um, as far as other times of the day before bedtime, I would make that part of the routine, empty that bladder before bedtime. Um, so then again, you know, that's a helpful thing if they're successful, you know, really reward them. So.
Yes. Um, my daughter's almost two and a half, and before she turned two, we had some mild success. Um, mm -hmm. But since then, she's afraid to wear underwear. She she'll sit on the potty and she'll flush and say bye bye, but she hasn't had any success since. Okay. I don't know how to get her. Do you have a, like a toilet seat, a small? Yeah, we have a little and then we have the seat, and she puts the seat on and climbs up there. So she gets it, and she tells me when she goes in her diaper, but she just won't go on the. Potty. Were there any events that you can relate to back when mm -hmm. and we're looking at the list that we gave? There might be other things too. Mm -hmm. A dog died or anything like that, or now I have we have a new baby. Right. Okay. Well, maybe maybe that's you know again. I would just back off a little bit. Let how old is your baby? Three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah. So give a little time. You know, it's kind of like um, you know it, she had the it was she your first child. So she's had all your attention, and now that, like we talked about, um, that she because of the nature of a three-week-old baby, she can't have all your attention. I mean, you know, it's got to be split, and usually it's more for the baby because the need is greater there. So any attention is better than no attention at all. And so changing a diaper, all those things, that's attention. She she's getting you away from the baby. Not that you should, you know, think well that's what she's up to. No, that's just a natural thing. And so as she adjusts to the baby, again, another thing you can do to help with that, that's where grandpa and grandma come in or, you know, they can give attention. Let, let that be a red flag that she just needs more attention. It's great to learn at three or two and a half, you're not the center of the universe and you have to share with other people and that's what she's learning. So it's a, it's a huge deal. And so, and so she sees other kids and, you know, they practice there, but she won't go there either. <coughs> There, so. Yeah, but it's, your attention is different than their attention. I mean, the parent's attention is number one. You know, even for teenagers, studies after studies show, regardless what they tell you at home, that your attention is the most important thing in their life. And so, you know, so that's getting your attention. Um, and so, um, so hang in there. It's going to get better. And she'll, if she had success early on, she's she's just taking a few uh, one step backward before she takes two steps forward again. So hang in there and it'll, it'll come back. Um, you know, another thing, you know, we talked about a little bit and I just heard a little bit is that, you know, different from the first half of the century that, you know, we have a busier lifestyle. You know, we don't always realize it, but, you know, we're, our, the attention that we're able to give them is a lot less than probably it was 50 years ago, especially when both parents work outside the home. And so if she's at daycare, what she's looking for when she gets home is your attention. I had one child um, who... Um, was fine at daycare, didn't have any accident, was perfect all day long at daycare. Uh, he was like a little boy, three and a half, and um, they um, just had had a baby as well. The baby was probably about two months old now. And, um, but as soon as he got home, he would take off his pants, put his diaper on, and poop his pants. And, and you know, really that was just the red flag that said, you know, hey, I want to be changed now. It was almost like he was taking a vacation. It's like, I worked hard all day, now I'm going to come home and relax. You know, it's a, it's a safe place and I can enjoy it now. And let me put that diaper again. A little boy didn't care. But he got his parents' attention who both worked outside the home and they saw him at night. And so, so he wanted their attention. So, I, you know, I think, we, I think there's a huge... We don't always realize how much they're they're asking for that. So so let that be a red flag. You know, I, I always tell parents, uh, you know, no um, bad attention is better than no attention. So if they, you know, even if they act out, you know, that's what they're trying to do is get your attention. So there was somebody over here. There was a second. Yes, back there. Uh, does the child need to show all of the signs that they're they're ready to be potty trained? Uh, for example, my daughter, um, she'll tell us when she has to poop or if she does poop. In her pants, um, but she can't hold her, her urine real long, and there's some other things to know. She's kind of half and half. So I, I'm, I'm just to rephrase the question because I couldn't quite hear all of it. I want to make sure I understand it. Um, you said she's showing all the signs that she's ready. Not all of them. She's. That's what I'm wondering. How does she have to show all signs? Or <clears throat> how do I know when she's ready to? Well, how old is she? 22 months. So she's showing some signs like what? What signs is she showing? When she has to go, <coughs> excuse me, when she has to, but she, she doesn't do anything with the potty. She has to pee. Um, she kind of grunts or, you know, you can tell that she has to go. <coughs> excuse me. 
Well, um, it sounds like she's kind of at that threshold. Um, you can, you know, start the process like we talked about with, you know, starting to talk to her about it, starting to go through dry runs, um, you know, have her watch you. Um, that's a big thing, you know, modeling um, and, you know, begin that process. You know, it sounds like, you know, um, she is she able to be go periods of time like four hours at night without having a bowel movement? So, so it sounds like physically she's getting there. And so, you know, just start that process and um, take advantage of the 20 minutes after a meal. And um, I think you're, you're right at the door, so. Who's asking how many of the signs should she have before she proceeds? Like how many of the signs? Because even my daughter has some of these signs and she's not ready. I mean, she can't hold still. Well, if she doesn't have all of them, I mean, you know, some kids, I mean, and then there's the issue of kids who later on are diagnosed with ADD or, you know, other types of things. Um, you know, the, the sit in one spot for a period of time is important um, to, in order to be successful. Um, but, um, you know, some kids, you know, at age 14, they're still not sitting in one spot. So, you know, uh, you know, for the most part, you know, as parents, when they're, you know, they have the majority of what they need to do what they need to do. And that, you know, that might be a detriment too, because you can't sit still long enough to go to the bathroom. So, um, so those, and, but that helps you to understand why we haven't quite made it yet. Cause she doesn't may, maybe have all those, all those things yet. What would you recommend as far as underwear is concerned? Do pull-ups work better than like big girl underwear with I don't know. Like, I've heard that pull-ups feel more like diapers, so they don't necessarily realize that they're body training. Yeah, and again, you know, again, we talked about the the diaper and change. You know, it's so it's a great transition. Every child is different. Some kids might want to go right straight from a diaper to big boy pants. Some kids have to do the transition where they're doing the, you know, the regular diaper, then they go to pull up diapers, then they go to training pants, and then eventually they're in the regular underwear. So every child is different, you know, so um, you kind of have to just use your judgment on that. But definitely a pull up is a, a great transition. So especially at nighttime, I definitely would do that because it takes them longer to be dry at night and be successful at night, at least six months longer on the average. We're kind of in a power struggle with my daughter. Do you have any suggestions on that? Yeah, and that's that's kind of what we touched on a little bit, and it's right at that age when the power struggle develops. So what I suggest, if if you're if you're kind of butting heads all the time, then just just step back, just put it on hold for a while. Well, and every child's different, but you know, basically, um, what happens sometimes it just kicks in. You know, they see, they realize, you know, that Dora doesn't wear diapers. You know, their favorite football player doesn't wear diapers, or Elmo doesn't wear diapers. And so, why did, why am I still wearing diapers? So I don't know what happens, but sometimes it just kicks in when they realize this is what I want to do necessarily. But you, you usually those power struggles, especially when it comes to to uh, toilet training, it just lead to more negative consequences. I mean, there's there's lots of battles over the next. 18 years you're gonna to have to fight and so pick your battles and this is one that you probably want to just back off on until they're ready so yes right right here I, on the, the night training I I mean we're struggling <laughs> and I don't know I guess I don't know where to start she wears pull-ups at night sometimes she wakes up but she's always wet in the morning a little bit but why we go potty before bed we no longer have a drink at bedtime she used to have a drink at bedtime but I do I I guess my thing is, I think, I'm wondering if the pull-up is partially preventing her from potty. I mean, if she were maybe wet the bed a few times, would that be beneficial for her to understand? Or How old is your child? She's almost four. Almost four, okay. So, um, you know, that in talking to a lot, again, night training is a lot different than the daytime training because there's a lot of other issues that are involved. There's genetics. You know, there's the bell curve where the average is five to six years to be dry at night. So she's not quite there yet. Um, and then there's the genetic patterns. So sometimes in uh, dad or mom's family, there might be somebody who was 12 before they were dry at night. And those that can be a tendency then. Doesn't mean that's going to happen to her, but it, there's that tendency. And that's still part of the normal bell curve. Um, there's the deep sleepers. 
There's the kids that, that, you know, doesn't seem to bother them or they're not quite deep sleeping, but, you know, they, they realize, hey, I'm always wet, so what, you know, I might as well just wake up wet. Um, so one thing you can try in the four-year-old, again, it's depending on the child, is the, what we talked about before. You have them take, you know, not that they did anything wrong, but it, to take just part of the normal daily living um, that, you know, there's consequences for what things that happen. And so that, you know, a four-year-old can take the sheets off the bed and carry them over to the washer. I've done that. I'm still, I mean, I just, it's like, it's a struggle. I'm like, okay. We're then, and I know I have an older one, and she was potty trained. At, she was easy. And the second one's been a little bit harder, and she has more accidents off and on during the day. But we've we kind of got that cleared up where she's dry all day. But, I mean, I guess I just feel like I'm wondering if maybe the pull-ups at night are causing her to... Well, you know... Yeah, if, if she has pulls up, so you can still have a mess in the morning with pull ups because sometimes they don't always hold all the urine. But, um, goes to the bathroom. But I'm just thinking, I don't know, I guess I, I hate for her to wake up wet all the time in bed. Do you have other family members on either side of the family that were later bedwetters? I haven't had okay. any issues with anybody okay. that we've known of, you know. Okay. Um, well, I. Yeah, you know, I mean, you, uh, you could try it. You can try just the training pants and, and let her experience that. And then, is she a deep sleeper? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes she sleeps yeah. like, you know, she's like, like, you walk in the room and she wakes up. You know, the deep sleepers, that what happens is most of us wake up because we feel discomfort. When our bladder fills to a certain level, we feel discomfort. But the deep sleepers are such deep sleepers that they don't wake up and they just lose, they, their bladder can't hold it and then they lose it. Those are the ones that usually it runs in families and, and um, you know, they're bedwetters at age eight or nine at nighttime. They're fine during the day, but they have night problems at night. So, um, you know, that, that's just something that, there's things that can be done to help with that. And that's where I would suggest, you know, if that's happening, you know, try the, the training pants, because she's only four. So, you know, she's still right at the average age and realize just give it a little more time. And then if you're still having problems, then that would be something you could talk to your pediatrician about or your physician, and they can give you some, there's helpful aids out there as well. Medication sometimes, some, you know, night alarms. I, I don't think that waking them up in two hours is a helpful thing. I think the only person who gets trained is the parent. You're not really helping them to, they might wake up dry in the morning, but again, they have, if you didn't wake them up, they'll still wake up wet. So that's been my experience anyway, so. Yes. Oh, there was one right back here. Yes. Um, if you're getting them on a routine of going every so often and they don't want to sit on the potty chair, they're playing or doing whatever, is it something you should still force them into kind of doing on a routine every, you know, 20 minutes after the meal or whatever? Like she'll play and I'll say, do you want to go sit on the potty? And she'll say, no, I don't want to do it. Or... Well, I mean, again, you know, it's depending on your style of training, how old is the child? So, you know, a lot of times if you give a two and a half year old a choice, they're probably not going to do what you want them to do. So routine, it's kind of like what, what, you know, bedtime, if you give them, you want to go to bed tonight at, you know, eight or 10, you know, they'll, they'll tend to pick the later time. So, you know, again, at two and a half, you, the routines will look, work better. And, and it's interesting, they find more security in that. Mm -hmm. So that's us being the parent and just saying, you know. Should I force it or just? Well, and again, that's where you try to make it a positive experience. You know, the, the Mickey Mouse timer, the, you know, the praise, the, you know, just approaching it. Take and make sure you have the time to do it. You know, if it's a rush thing, you know, I've made that mistake before myself where I've rushed things and it becomes a real negative experience. And if you don't have the time to do that, then, you know, you might just take a holiday then and come back to it later because it sounds like it's becoming a little bit of a power struggle too, so. Too much to try to get them to sit on the potty chair like once an hour or like is there well i would say three or four times a day limiting for one minute for every year of age so and use an egg timer so that you know you don't for you know we're in the kitchen working and all of a sudden you know it's been oh my goodness it's been 20 minutes i've been sitting in there so for question and then we'll stop yes right here um i was just gonna ask as far as for boys is it easier to teach them to sit first and then to stand and then yeah, very much so it's much easier. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes I've seen also where some people teach them to kneel. And, uh, you know, and that's a little bit easier as well, too. So just not just sit, going from sitting to kneeling and then standing. And so, um, uh, again, you have to have a toilet that's the right size. Be careful with the lid, all those things. 
Um, but you know, the aim gets better with practice, I guess. So, um, and then, you know, it's helpful if you don't have carpet around the toilet or the toilet seat, um, so that, you know, there's less chance of, of, of you're going to have accidents. So if you've got a tile floor, that's, you should try to use that bathroom with the tile floor, if that's a possibility. So it's easier to clean and all those things. All right, well, we're going to just stop right now because it's 7 o'clock. But I'm going to stay around. If there's any more questions, uh, feel free to come on down. I'll stay as long as there's questions. And um, I just want to thank you again for coming out tonight. It's been a real joy and privilege talking to you. And good luck with toilet training.